Hello, First Church, and greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Blessings be upon you all. In the last couple of months, we have moved through a couple of related sermon and worship series that have helped us hopefully to be able to deal with the circumstances that we've been living in, particularly regarding COVID, um, and, and hopefully being able to help us think about what's the best way to live in and through these circumstances, particularly through lives of generosity. Today is our eighth and last week in this two-part series, and we're going to begin our time in worshiping God with a hymn called God of the Ages. And the very last verse of that hymn There's a couple of lines of it that goes like this. Refresh thy people on their toilsome way. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine. May that be so as we worship and live into another week as God's people. Sin and darkness, whose love is mighty 
and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all amazing grace this is unfailing love then you would take my grace then you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that I would be set free chaos back into order who makes an orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Then you would take my place. Good morning for church. Uh, the scripture reading from today, again, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses uh, 41 and 42. And this time is from the NIV version. And the Word of God says, If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, my friend, let me invite you and let us pray together at this time. We are in the middle of uh, difficult times, not just in our community or in our country, but in, an, in our world as well. Let us pray together. Let us 
raise our voices to our Lord. God is ready to listen our prayers. So let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the last week, beautiful weather, beautiful time. And thank you, Father, for these coming days that we haven't had. We're going to give you thanks for those days. Thank you for your, for your blessings upon our lives, upon the lives of the, our family, upon the lives of our loved ones. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the food that you put on our tables as well. Thank you, Father. We don't have words to express our gratitude to you because you have mercy on us. And at this time, Lord, as a family in Christ, we pray, Lord, that you can continue, Father, extending your blessing for those people who are not doing well, for those people who are not feeling well at this time, for those people who are struggling, Lord, with different issues or problems in their lives. Help them, Father. We pray for them that you can have mercy upon them as you have mercy upon us. Lord, thank you for our lives. Thank you for their lives. Help them, Father, and please, Lord, extend your healing hand upon them. Father, at this time, we also pray for our church, and we also pray for every single ministry of our church. Thank you, Father, for giving us the courage the con to continue serving you in, in different ways. And one of the ways is through our giving, because we are generous, because you are generous to us, because you provide, Lord, the food on the table. You provide to us, Lord, the shoes on our feet. You provide, Lord, to us the roof that we can rest at night. You provide, Lord, to us anything that we ask for. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You provide, Lord, our jobs. You provide, Lord, every single thing that we ask you. Lord, you are there. You provide because you are our provision. Thank you for that. Thank you for our hearts, for those, these generous hearts to you. Bless our lives as we give every single week, as we give to the poor, as we give to the need, as we give, Lord, our time, as we give, Lord, our resources, as we give anything that you ask us to do or to give. Because we understand that every time that we give, every time you bless us and bless us and bless us more and more, and we have much. Thank you, Father. We pray also, Father, for those people who are not feeling well in the hospitals. We pray, Lord, for the sick. We pray, Lord, for those who are in jail. We pray, Lord, for those who are traveling around the world and they are afraid. We pray, Lord, for those who are captive. We pray, Lord, for everyone, Father. We are just your instruments in your hands. Give us words of hope and healing to everyone. Give us words of life to everyone every time that we speak. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for your word and you speak through our hearts. Thank you. Thank you for the songs that we worship you because in every song you speak to our lives as well as we adore you because you are the only one who deserves the glory and honor. Father, thank you. Thank you. And at this time, Father, we pray that prayer that you taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now in Spanish. Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre. Venganos hoy tu reino y hágase tu voluntad así la tierra como en el cielo. Danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día y perdona nuestras ofensas así como nosotros también perdonamos a aquellos que nos ofenden. Y no nos dejes caer en la tentación, mas líbranos de mal, porque tuyo es el reino, la gloria y el poder. And God's people say, Amen. Thank you. God bless you all. Good morning, First Church. I hope you are doing well wherever you are. Maybe you're watching from home or from the office or maybe you're even at school. It's been so long since I've been able to catch up with most of you. I wanted to give you a quick update about myself and what's going on at home. Um, Michelle and I are doing quite well. We're both healthy. We're working from home. Uh, we're trying to connect as, as best we can in small groups or with, um, with close friends and family. But we're mostly alone and we have been since the end of March. And so life is uh, really different right now. Uh, for example, I've traded out all my clothes for uh, sweatpants and t-shirts and hoodies. Uh, I no longer can tell the difference between a weekday and a weekend. And my closest friends are a couple of birds in the backyard and the Amazon delivery driver. If I go more than a couple days without something being del delivered to the house or dropped off of the house, I start to get just a little bit anxious. And just this week, I met a major COVID milestone. I am now able to feed the chipmunks that live in my backyard right out of the palm of my hand. Now that should give you an idea of the current state of my uh, mental health. Now all kidding aside, I think the series that we're in right now, it's uh, called Generous Living, is timely because right now as we self-contain and sort of isolate and our social patterns um, sort of get reduced to small groups or maybe even fewer. The focus is all on ourselves. It's a time where we can easily become self-absorbed simply due to the nature of protecting ourselves and our family and the restrictions imposed on us um, in the community for the sake of public health. But as people of the kingdom of God, we must always be looking out for other people. Especially now, we need to be reminded that we are being called to a generous life. Last week, Pastor Lisa pointed us to the story of the widow's might, where Jesus commends a poor widow for the gift that she gives at the temple, not because of the amount of her gift, but because she gave all that she had. So Pastor Lisa explained to us that that gift was a signal, or that generous life was a signal of someone who trusts God and someone who seeks to honor God. Today, we're going to take a look at an often quoted phrase from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God loves a cheerful giver. We're going to spend just a few moments with Paul's letter to the Corinthians in a section that's labeled generosity encouraged. The briefest of backgrounds to this passage is this. Paul is sending Titus to take up an offering at the church in Corinth. And it's going to be delivered to the church in Jerusalem who is going through uh, trial. A lot of struggling. The church in Corinth was so eager to give that reports of their enthusiasm was having a contagious effect on the churches um, all over the north in Macedonia. So Paul's been bragging about the church in Corinth. And now it's time for him to actually go and collect the offering. And so this whole thing has been hyped up. And in his letter to Corinthians, he wants to remind the people um, that their generosity should remain an issue of the heart and not because everything is getting all hyped up. And in that message is one of the most helpful descriptions of what generous living should look like. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses, starting at verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 
Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Back in 2006, there was a movie that came out called The Breakup. I don't know if you remember that, but it was a romantic comedy about two people in a tenuous relationship. Uh, their names were Brooke and Gary, and they break up, and it's hilarious. Uh, one of uh, the early scenes in the movie, this couple's having an argument about doing the dishes. Brooke would like to do the dishes before they go to bed because she doesn't want to wake up I don't like to up a to dirty kitchen. kitchen. And Gary, who's lounging on the couch playing video games, he says, who cares? I don't care about that. Uh, perhaps you've had a similar argument in your house. So after they argue a little bit, Gary uh, relents and he just sort of rolls his eyes and he throws his game controller down. He says, fine, I'll help, help with the dishes. dishes. And Brooke responds with, you, you know, know what? what? No, Never that's mind. That's not what I don't I want. want that. And Gary says, I thought you wanted my help. You just, you said, just said you wanted you want my help with the dishes. dishes. And Brooke says, I want you to want to do the dishes. And Gary says, why would I want to do dishes? I mean, this is, you know, a pretty philosophical movie as well. Now, playfully, uh, Michelle and I, we quote this movie all the time at our house. I'll say, hey, Michelle, let's go do the dishes. And she'll say, why would I want to do the dishes? Do you see how that exchange is related to our scripture for this morning? Let's look at that particular verse again. Paul writes, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I want you to want to do the dishes. I want you to want to give. It's not a matter of the action. And to be clear, in either case, whether it's cleaning or charitable giving, both are great things on their own, but what is going on in the heart, the motivation is what matters to God. In fact, Paul states very clearly, God loves the cheerful giver, the one who wants to give. So what kind of giver are you? Are you a cheerful giver? Are you a reluctant giver? Do you often feel like giving maybe isn't for you, at least maybe not at this time? Maybe you think if God wanted you to give more money away, he would have given you more in the first place. Whenever I read or hear the phrase, God loves a cheerful giver, I always cringe a little bit because personally, I'm more of a reluctant giver, which is precisely why I wanted to deliver this message today. It's not because I'm so good at giving or that I am the cheeriest of cheerful givers, but it, it's because it's something I've struggled with, but I have learned how to overcome my reluctance towards giving. And so I wanna be very practical with you for the rest of our time together. And I'm sort of directing this content more towards the reluctant giver or maybe the person who just sort of sporadically or doesn't give at all. If you're already a cheerful giver, uh, Paul already has sort of this wonderful summary for you. He says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, in all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. For the rest of us, I would like to share with you what has worked for me and perhaps what can work for you too. So these are practical ways to help overcome a reluctance to give. The first thing is, there's three things. The first thing is, to ask yourself the right kinds of questions. About 10 years ago, I got in kind of a wonky relationship with giving, even to the church who was at the time paying my salary. I rejected the notion of disciplined giving, feeling like God only wanted my obedience when my heart was really in it. So with generosity, I wanted to give only when I felt like I was being led to give. That way I could be sure that my actions were always from the heart and not in some kind of uh, legalistic territory. I expected that motivation would come from either a desire 
uh, internal desire to be generous or because God would give me the motivation. I kind of flipped the whole cheerful giver equation on its head, and this was my thinking. I'm only going to give if I'm cheerful about it. After a few years of doing this, I noticed that my giving became less and less frequent because wouldn't you know it, rarely did I feel like giving away my money. When Michelle and I got married, like I assume most people do, we got into a discussion about how much money we were going to give to the church. So I kind of dropped that inverse cheerful giver philosophy on her. And she was clearly confused by this and countered by simply asking, don't you think that God wants us to be generous to the church all the time? Well, yeah, I guess I did think that. Now, that wasn't the end of the discussion. In fact, that was just the beginning. And we're still constantly discussing what we want to do with our money and how we want to bless people. And those discussions, they're not always cheerful, but they're important discussions. The beginning of change for me started with asking a different kind of question. Instead of asking, do I feel like giving this time? Or am I cheerful about it this time? Or am I being called to give this week? The question became, what kind of person do I want to be? As a follower of Jesus, I want to be the kind of person who, when compelled to go one mile, offers to go two. That was the verse that Pastor Caesar read for us just earlier. I want my concern for others to outweigh my concern for myself. I want to give those who ask and not turn away those who wish to borrow. And if I strive to be that person through generosity of spirit and time and resources, I expect that God will fill me up with the goodness and joy he's promised to those who do so. And that's not just some vain expectation. It's what Paul literally says God will do. He says, you will be enriched in every way. Now, just because you might be asking the right kind of question, that doesn't mean that giving will suddenly be easy for you. That's why an important part of overcoming a reluctance uh, to giving, for at least for me and maybe for you, and this is the second thing, is to create a plan that works for you or simply create a plan. I almost wish one of the Ten Commandments was, thou shalt open a spreadsheet and draft a budget for thine household income. I'd have a really good sermon to preach then because one of the biggest helps to me in overcoming my reluctant giving was creating a plan. It helped take some of the negative emotion out of giving. Or I should say some of the negative emotion out of giving away my money. In our house, I'm the one who primarily wants to save. Generosity is tough for me because giving away money seems counterintuitive to my desire to save. Now, Michelle is the one in the house who... Uh, for who uh, generosity uh, seems natural. Now, early in our marriage, as I've already alluded to, we were trying to figure out how to communicate about money and finances, our values, our habits, and our goals with money. Uh, Michelle would operate with a budget, and I never looked at it. I didn't care. I was just like, you know what? As long as we're not spending more than you know we're bringing in, I'm cool. Like if we're saving money, which we were because. We had been two incomes combined to one suddenly. As long as that was happening, then I had no interest in the budget. You know, I was just sort of, uh, I was out of the loop, I guess you could say. The only time I'd start asking questions about the budget was when Michelle would say, hey, uh, I had to buy a wedding gift for my friend and I got this um, card for my mom and I gave money to someone at the intersection of blah, blah, blah. And I, I bought us tickets to a fundraiser dinner and I thought we could, we could um, send a little extra money uh, to somebody this month. And when she would say those kinds of things, I could just feel my blood rising. And then, you know, inevitably I would blurt out something like, why are we wasting our money on cards and tchotchkes and GoFundMes and overpriced coffee and all this and all that? and then the argument would begin. For the most part, I would have to walk back those statements. You see, I didn't really believe that it was a waste of money. And after some further apologies and discussions, I'd have to admit that I wanted us to be generous in those ways, but it always felt out of control with me. And that's because I didn't have a plan. 
So Michelle and I took the Dave Ramsey class, Financial Peace University, and I got completely geeked out on creating and managing a budget. I went from casual indifference towards the budget to laser focused interest. And it freed me to be more generous. And I'm serious about that. I, it can't get more practical than that. If you want help in living generously, make a plan. For those of us who are reluctant givers, a plan offers freedom from negative emotions that always push back against charitable giving. So now when Michelle tells me that she's buying a baby gift for the neighbors, for example, I think, great, let's put that on the budget and then I'm genuinely excited to spend that money on others because that's precisely what that money has been set aside for. I, I'm not worried about, oh, is, is that money going to be taking away from our grocery budget or our savings or you know, our vehicle maintenance budget? I know that we have a budget for giving and so when the opportunity comes, we're ready to just give it away. It is so freeing, ironically setting a boundary for the generosity freed me to give it away cheerfully. What happens to some people is uh, they make a decision to give or maybe they're at least asking the right question. What kind of person do I want to be? But then they don't make a plan and pretty soon emotions get involved and a fight breaks out and suddenly you wonder if charitable giving is even for you. So try making a plan. The plan should be according to, to both what you want to give, but also what you are capable of giving or what you can give. If we were to go back to our um, text that we're using this morning and just back up one chapter to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul writes this, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So, so even if you've started asking the right kinds of questions, your eagerness to give needs to be tempered by a plan. I have some friends who got really jazzed up about giving, and so they, they dropped a large amount of money uh, in the offering one Sunday. And I think they felt really good about that. But then at the end of the month, they were wondering if they'd have enough money to pay all the bills. Now, something like that can happen and really drain the joy out of giving because without the plan, we might be unintentionally inviting negative emotions on a regular basis. There are times when we're called to give outside the plan or to give sacrificially. We'll be called on to be generous when we aren't sure that the money, the time, or the emotional strength is there. And in those moments, we hope that God lifts us up and helps us rise to the occasion. And that's why the, the third and maybe the most important thing that I want to include, the, the thing that helped me overcome my reluctance to give, is prayer. Ask God to be involved. Make him an equal partner in your thoughts and your communication and your strategy of generosity. One of my most common prayers is that God would make me more generous. I recognize my shortcomings in this area, probably above all else. Often as we sit down for dinner, I pray thanksgiving for God's provision. I ask that he extend that provision to the people who don't have what we have. And then I ask that God would use us to fill in that gap. When you struggle with motivation, pray. When you sit down to make your plan and go over the figures, pray. When you celebrate the joy uh, and, the, and the cheerfulness of generosity, pray. When you are tempted to skimp on your giving, for goodness sakes, pray. Lately, I've, I've had a keen sense of time getting away from me. As we spend weeks and months away from our loved ones, shut up in our houses knowing we can't get this time back, it sort of creates a existential crisis, maybe a mini existential crisis. I can sense my opportunities dwindling and I know I have a lot of work to do because, to become one who embodies the generous life. And so I pray that God would redeem what time I have left for his kingdom, sometimes in spite of myself. If you wanna be more generous in life and love, then be on your knees in prayer, my friends, 
Ask God to give you what you do not have. Until the generous life flows out of you naturally, keep asking God to grant you a heart for others. Ask God to give you the opportunities to bless the kingdom and ask God for the means to do so. One last time, Paul's words, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now let's pray together. Lord God, may we lean on the assurance of your grace and your promise of blessing as we seek to extend generosity towards others. Forgive us for the times we only think of ourselves. Give us the courage to act faithfully in the moments when our generosity is put to the test. Make us into the people you will have us be. Give us all we need today so that we may share it with others tomorrow. I ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Generosity is a way of being, if you will. It's a way of being that is a blessing to both the giver and the receiver. It is a way of being that is practiced, it's taught, it's witnessed to, and it is then learned. We're going to hear how this has played out in three generations today in the Moon and Vetter family. So let's listen. Good morning. We're here um, with Carl and Margie Moon and Tom and Lauren Vetter with their sons, Jack and Will. And with the series that we're doing of Spirit of Generosity, we thought it'd be nice to have a generation show us and tell us their testimony about tithing and what it means to them and their family. Did you do anything intentionally to, to teach tithing to your kids? Did you, was this something that you've always done throughout your life and the importance of it? How was that translating to how you lived your life and how you affected your girls? Um, church attendance and participation in church activities was a big part of both Carl and my growing up. I can't remember intentionally teaching giving to our children. They were given an allowance and were expected to contribute to their church school offering. I think we taught our daughters to give of themselves, both financially and uh, in, the, in terms of their time, uh, their money and their time. Uh, when Lauren was uh, in high school, freshman in high school, we uh, encouraged her to go on a mission trip. And we actually encouraged her by saying, we're going to be on a mission trip and so are you. <laughs> so she wasn't too happy about that, but when she came back, uh, it, everything had changed for her. And so she was, uh, actually she went on four more mission trips after that. Tom, you're new to, newer to the family. I mean, you've been with them for a long time, but you didn't grow up with them. And Lauren, you did. So how both of your life experiences with your parents, Lauren and Tom with yours, that tithing became so important to you guys. And we had been married about a year and um, we picked a book off the shelf that someone had actually given to us as a wedding present, which is Dave Ramsey's um, Total Money Makeover. And so we read that when we had been married a year and then got on um, a budget and started tithing and had a set amount um, every week that we were going to the church. One of the first things we did was instead of having that line item at the bottom of our budget, we put it at the top. So we always intentionally gave instead of just giving what was left over at the end of the week. Lauren, when you brought me Jack's envelope, tithing envelope, and he specifically asked to have his own uh, account set up so he could keep track of his tithing. That just really struck a chord for me. What was it that you did for Jack and Will that Jack did that? And then Jack, I want to hear from you too, buddy. <laughs> me? Now? Do you want to tell your story? A camera? Yeah. Sure. What time? Right. Oh. Uh, so what What made you start to give to church? Um, envelopes. Envelopes. Give. Save. It's been so Jack came to us and wanted a Lego set, and um, we said that he could earn the money with a chore chart. 
Um, and so we gave him um, chores that he had to do each week. And then if he um, got all the money, um, he had to put some in each envelope. And so he had an envelope, um, the give envelope, where he had set that money aside for church. And then um, he also decided at that point that he would add some additional money to his piggy bank. I gave some money to church, some extra money, and I also worked towards some money to give to church. That's right. You thought about giving it away and giving it to the church? That is incredible. That's awesome, Jack. Will, you have a story to share too, don't you? How about, how about your snacks? How your snacks? Do you like to share your snacks with everybody? When you have a snack, you always offer it to someone else. First. Every time we give telegrams. Will always likes to share. Yeah. That's awesome. You're starting young, Will. That's great. <laughs> Thank you guys for sharing your testimony with us this morning. Is there anything else you guys want to add uh, to help us understand what the spirit of generosity means to you and the importance of tithing? Tithing um, has been a priority in our marriage, and God has blessed us with the means to give and the desire to give and the trust in God's provision for us as a couple and as a family. And we give because we believe in God's holy word that instructs us to give. And we believe in God's mission in the world. And we believe in this church's mission. Uh, the Lord has been faithful to our family through many um, health issues. And now our daughter and son-in-law and their children are part of this church family. And Carl and I are thankful that you have welcomed them and loved them. Tom and I have always found over the years that the more that we have given, um, the more that we have been blessed in so many different areas of our lives. I just say you can't outgive God. <laughs> all right, well, thank you again. Thank you for your time and energy with all of this today. Thank you.
friends, as we get ready to move forward into the rest of our week, a few announcements that I want to lift up. This afternoon is the crop walk. Our circumstances have changed in order to make sure that we are all kept safe, but there are people who are walking in a crop walk, either as a, as a present um, walker or as a virtual walker. And it's not too late to support this crop walk that starts today at two o'clock. You can still give a donation online and you can do that through looking up crop walk in McHenry County. And if you want to support our team, look for the first church team to be able to make your donation. The second announcement has to do with Trunk or Treat. Coming up in October, it has been our tradition to welcome the community and to celebrate and enjoy the excitement of little ones in their costumes. And we are looking at this point for people who want to open up their trunks and serve treats to the kiddos in our community and congregation. If you're willing and ready to do something like that, please send an email to Karen Klaus. And then finally, um, we have sent out one more survey to the congregation asking for your input around some questions. That went out in yesterday's e-news. Please take a look at that and, and, and return that survey to us as soon as you can. We wanna be able to hear from you so we can continue planning for ministries on into the fall and winter seasons. So now let's think back just for a moment to that song that we sung at the beginning. Refresh thy people on their toilsome way and fill all our lives with love and grace divine. Go forth in the name of God May your lives be refreshed. May you be filled with love and grace divine in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Go forth into this week in the name of God to live as the children of God. I pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next week.